Thanks for coming. Hello, I'm James. <coughs> Ollie. I think um, you should tell us your names as well. Yeah. So there's only four of you. So it won't take too long. I'm Max. Hi. Max. Natalie. Natalie. Thomas. Thomas. Hannah. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Great. And what do you guys all do at the uh, I do a bit of everything, so I act primarily, I write my insurers and direct and, like I was saying, reluctantly produce. <laughs> We're still reluctantly <laughs> producing <laughs> 20 years later. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. I'm not the best producer brand, but I produce my own work as well. Yeah. Cool. Get out there. Yeah, no, I'm working front of house stuff at the moment, just out of uni, but looking for some production stuff. Mm-hmm. Production. I'm a producer general manager from Razor. Sometimes take a risk with artists, sometimes for hire others, <laughs> just to do the work. Uh, I'm an artist that Natalie's taking a risk with. <laughs> 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 I make theatre. Okay, cool. No, it's, that's good to know. Um, if we come to the next mm-hmm. slide, thank you. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk. I'm, I'm going to look at my phone for timing purposes, not because of any other reason, but uh, we'll talk for about. Uh, 35, 40 minutes, and then have some questions. And you know, because there's only it's intimate, we can talk all about any questions you want about anything, really. But it's good to know what you guys do. Um, what, how we're going to structure this is, is essentially talk about us and how we started, but and, and how we, I guess, maintained 20 years because we turned 20 this year. Uh, thank you very much, uh, which is scary. But um, the, our route is what we'll talk about. Of course, there's a million other routes, and I'm sure we'll talk about that at the end. But all, all we can talk about is how we, you know, started uh, and who we are. Uh, so, uh, as a company, you know, we <laughs> reluctant producers, as uh, someone said. We should have that yes, on our business card. We should have that on our business card. Might make that. Um, right, because it, it, was, uh, it was a desire just to put theatre on, and Ollie will talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, but we, we are creators, Ollie and I, we're, we're directors, Ollie's a writer, uh, we are both actors, he's still an actor, not so much anymore, just about. So we are inherently creators, but uh, also producers. Uh, but I think we suddenly realised what producing was. Um, and realised what we were doing, only looking back. In fact, I had a call this morning where it was a high-level marketing meeting and talking to this very important marketing company, and they were talking about something, and I was like, oh yeah, I did that five years ago. Uh, so, through necessity, so that, that's kind of who we are, but I don't think we want to lose who we are at the essence of the company in terms of creators, and we, we work with, collaborate with lots of creative people. Uh, what links all of our stuff together, we'll do a little uh, example of some of our work, is storytelling. And, and that sounds quite glib in a way, but, but it's not it's important to us whether we're doing immersive shows or stage shows. What's important to us is story, uh, story, story, story. That comes first uh, ahead of anything else. Uh, more on a practical point of view, there's kind of five strands to the company uh, that has kind of evolved the stage shows, which is predominantly and always new pieces of writing, normally by by Oli. Um, We do immersive shows, large scale immersive shows. We do brand activations, which are sound quite plain, but they're anything but. They uh, are very exciting kind of one day immersive shows, uh, of which we're doing one this month, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, We do outdoor shows, uh, touring uh, festivals, uh, which is really exciting. And then we have our Engage department, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, later, and that involves education, workshops, and opportunities, whether they're awards or schemes uh, for young theatre makers and people coming through. I think we feel quite passionate about that because we probably, both of us, came from a non-traditional route. We didn't go to drama school. uh, We didn't have training as such. uh, We just had a desire to put shows on. Uh, and how did we do that? Well, next slide, I will tell you a little bit how we did start. We started here, really, in the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Next slide. Yeah, I think we, we struggled for that ourselves, really, when we were kind of, like, I, I set up Les Enfants 20 years ago when I was 19, and, you know, at the time, it didn't ha- you know, it didn't know what that meant or how to do it. It's like like yourself, I'm sure you know the work that you want to do, but you don't know how you're going to do it. And then you end up 
becoming a producer, which, uh, you know, in that sense is just somebody who manages to make a piece of work, I suppose, in its definition. So, um, and I think, you know, particularly then we found it very, you know, I, I definitely found it hard to find ways in because I hadn't gone through the traditional route, because I wasn't, you know, hadn't gone, I wasn't writing through like a theatre or because I hadn't gone to drama school that um, I had to kind of find my own way um, and which involved kind of like the, our first show was at a place called The Space in the Isle of Dogs and the reason we got that was because my dad uh, was working on a building site opposite um, and he, my dad talks to anyone and he decided to go in there because he saw it was like a theatre space and started talking to the owner, Ali, and he was like, oh my son, what makes you theatre? And basically got me this person's uh, uh, business card, I think. And miraculously, I got in touch and then and then managed to convince them to give us a space to do a show. And um, and then I had to find people to be in the show, so I asked all my mates, as James was, um, and I asked all the friends that I, I, I could think right, I need someone to make the set, so I could think of one person, and that was Sam Wire, who I knew from when I was a kid. Very lucky that he turned out to be a bit of a genius, but that was kind of a stroke of luck. Like, I could think of one guy who could do the music, Tom Gisby. Again, it turned out he was also a genius, so I was quite, I was quite lucky in that regard. And then I thought of one uh, other person, and that was James. <laughs> uh, um, no, but then it was just like thinking about, you know, how to do it. But I think the, the world was a bit of a different place there. I think it's much harder now to find a space that, that would do that. Like, for our early years, <coughs> for a long time, we would do shows in spaces that would basically give us the space on a split. You know, so we would get it for free and then we would split the, split the ticket costs. And I think that's almost impossible now. Um, and also, you know, the, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is, you know, as we started. So we, we did the show at the space and then we managed to get the assembly rooms heard about it. And they basically took us to Edinburgh. I mean, now it sounds absolutely mental, but they heard about the show. They took it us was to the mental it, was, well. it was mental. They basically took us up to Edinburgh to the assembly rooms for our first year. And that was when I first experienced But also, I, I think... Uh, the Edinburgh Festival. Yeah, and a, a lot of... You know, not that people want to hear this, but you know, we were lucky as well that the assembly rooms had a show that dropped out yeah. really late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And someone had seen our show and said, "Have you thought about Edinburgh?" And we hadn't. I'd been mm. the year before as an actor, not not with with the company. You'd never been, but we all thought, "Well, let's do it." Yeah, I'd never been, and then being there, like suddenly, immediately, I think I was just absolutely taken with it because it was the first time that I felt like we were on a level playing field. It felt like if you if you made good work there, it would be recognised and it could compete with anybody. Um, regard, you know, you could be in the room next door to the National Theatre of Scotland and if your show was, if people liked your show more, you would, you know, it, it would get the same recognition. Again, I think probably in 20 years that has changed a bit. I mean, every, I feel like every year at the Edinburgh Festival, someone is saying, oh, it's not like it used to be. <laughs> but I do think there have been big changes in, I mean, really it's, it's in how much it costs, you know, more than anything. So, you know. The opportunities are still there. The opportunities are still there. It's just much harder to get there. Exactly. Because I think the costs uh, are, are much more prohibitive. And then as a result, that means the people that can go there the, the, it are suddenly like the, the pool of people that can make shows is suddenly drastically reduced and I think that's happened across the arts really in this country. So sorry, by yeah. you mean cost going up, is this just general inflation in the British society or actually you think there's I think other the, reasons? The cost of the, of the festival itself, I mean like uh, accommodation costs have definitely yeah. gone up, costs of um, all the, all the brochures and the shared brochures that people need to do 
um, you know, like marketing, I mean, inflation as well, mm -hmm. but, but definitely like the base cost, like being in venues is more expensive as well. Um, I don't know what else is, because it, 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 uh, we did our show, The Terrible Infants, which is sort of a, was a big crossover show for us. I think the, bud, the original budget for that was seven grand. Which is ridiculous. <laughs> you can't get a flat in Edinburgh for seven grand now. Well, not for that amount of people, no. Um, and it's a little bit of a, a touch point with companies and, and you know how we started initially of everyone mucking in together. So you mm. know, the big thing of like obviously paying people properly, which is very, very important. And so it should be. Uh, in the early days when we're all friends, you know, it was like, well, okay, we're all sharing in this all together in, in mm -hmm. to do something that's of actually, and that's why we could keep costs low. But of course, that's no one got paid. And yeah, no one, yeah, and that's not sustainable nor right. But it, yeah. but it, it's it's more of a case of like, and nor would I vindicate that of like, oh, not paying mm. people. But when you're taking a show up more professionally, you do have to pay people, and, and you want to pay them properly, and mm. and that obviously. Uh, is a, is a cost mm. thing. And, 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 you know, like publicity and all that. What I would say, actually, there has been a slight shift in recent years is with the free fringe, which I think is, is really building um, well and is actually serving artists. I, we've never done it, but I do know people that have done it and have actually done very well out of it. I mean, I think... I think if you come away from Edinburgh and you haven't lost money, <laughs> then you've done well. But I know some people have actually made money at but the also, yeah. and I do think that's quite a huge It was an avenue change. for us. I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how old the Vaults Festival is. Uh, uh, it would have been its 10th birthday this year. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so 20 years ago, obviously the Vaults Festival wasn't, wasn't here. Mm. And, and now the great stuff that the Vaults Festival do and, and the opportunities they give is, is, is something that probably you know, had we been starting, we, we would have come here. Yeah, um, because then you don't have to travel, travel loads of people up yeah, to Edinburgh um, and yeah. put, them in, put them up for mm. a month. And, but it is, yeah. it, it, it is somewhere, this is how we started and, and we, we are a big, you know, advocate of, of the Edinburgh Festival because it, you know, it suddenly feels that the whole industry decamps for three weeks of the year to, to Scotland and and it's very concentrated. There's a bit of a bubble, there's a lot wrong with it, but there's a lot right but with you it. Still, <laughs> you still can, they're few and far between, and like obviously there's obvious ones like Fleabag, but you know, Fleabag can still happen, and I think that is, there's not many places yeah. in the world where that can happen, where you can have one person. I remember we went to see Phoebe in the underbelly in a hundred seater, you know, there's not many places in the world where you can do a show like that with one person on a stool no. and then it becomes like a global but, And also, I remember one year someone said, do you want to go see these two Kiwis play some folk music yeah. songs? Like, no, that sounds rubbish. I shoot, I was like, no, no, you go, end up paying 50 quid to go and see them in the O2, sold mm -hmm. out, you know, last year, yeah, like the concourse. The concourse yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and Tim Minchin as well, who, you know, we... I do remember we did go and see We Tim. did. We see shared a venue with Tim Minchin, the first time, first, his first Edinburgh. And I remember Karen Corrin, who ran the Guild of Balloon, being like, this guy's going to be big. And and we like, yeah, she was right. So, yeah, we did a little cameo in our show. Yeah, that's that was exciting. We, were, we shared a venue with. But you do see those stories still of, of you know, being able to cut through like that, which I do think is pretty unique mm. and cool. And so for the first kind of seven years, if you want to do the next slide, uh, th this is kind of uh, how, how we kind of started, really, with shows. We would premiere a show in Edinburgh um, mm. and then uh, and then you know wait for another year do another show until I guess about round about our fourth show up to the fringe uh, I guess people started to take a little bit of notice of us and uh, mm. started to contact us by saying hey we like that show mm -hmm. we think you guys are quite good have you ever thought about doing a tour or bringing it to our venue and that's another thing about Edinburgh where there's a lot of producers mm. a lot of venues that do come up they're scouting We'd never booked at all, we didn't know how to do it. It was a show called Immaculate. Um, and we thought, yeah, why not? Let's let's organize a tour. So bef without realizing it, we were tour booking and producing a show on the road for our first tour in 2005 and 2006. I think that is the key about Edinburgh actually, which is a big thing. And you know, like 
again, the obvious example, like people talk about the plea bags and, oh, you're going to be at the National this like, that is a very, very rare thing. But you will be guaranteed to have the programmers from nearly all of the regional theatres attending mm -hmm. for at least a week. And so, you know, I think often when people go up, their focus is like the Scotsman, <laughs> the culture show, and, you know, uh, the national. And actually, I think if you were to spend all of that time focusing on smaller regional venues and regional promoters and regional producers, they're much more likely to kind of get back to you and give you a response and, and come and see your show. Like, you know, their job, when they go up to Edinburgh, they get the brochure like everyone else and they go through and go, what could fit? You know, if you aren't, if you have got a show and you think it could, you know it fits a certain type of size venue and you, and you do a little bit of research about uh, regional spaces that you think it could work in, I'm pretty confident that if you with enough time in hand, you contact the programmer of that venue and you say, if you're coming to Edinburgh, I love your space, I think this show is perfect for your space, I'd really like you to come and see it. I think you've got a very, very good chance of them doing that because, like I said, they've got to go up, they usually go up for like three or four days and they see like 12 shows a day and they've got to pick that from the thing. If they've got an email in their inbox saying, this is the show for you, this is what it is, I'd love to meet you, like, you know, strangely, I don't think they actually get loads of emails like that. So I do think, you know, spending a little bit of time thinking about the realistic, um, you know, obviously, hopefully, like a West Broadway producer will come in and snap it up and take you to Broadway. But failing that, um, doing a little bit, the musical. <laughs> yeah, failing that, doing a little bit of. of work on a kind of realistic stage two of like where could this go where would it fit you know what would like a modest six seven eight venue tour look like and then target those venues and then try and build relationships because at the end of the day you've got to remember like program is it's programmers jobs to find shows so they're not like trying to be gatekeepers. They want your shows as much as you want to give them to And, you know, a great thing about Edinburgh and the Vaults Festival as well is that, you know, and we alluded to this right at the top of the talk, or, and as you guys were coming in a little bit, is that it, it kind of forces you to do everything, and that's, mm. that, that is a good thing, because I believe that's how you get the best education of, of learning on the job of doing things. Uh, as part of the festival, like the Vaults Festival or the Edinburgh Festival, you are doing a lot of work. You are like thinking about the promotion, the marketing, the press, the you know even the stage management, and, and you learn a lot more of those jobs. And that was our education, really, of, of the industry was through Edinburgh, through a festival, putting on a show at a festival. Um, and you keep that. You know, it does it it does help. It does kind of affect the way that you think about things and, and make work in the future and and how you treat people yep. and all of that sort of stuff. I would say it, it did take about four years though of, of going, I mean and luckily those four shows that we did when we first started each year, they, they were you know, relatively successful and 50 seaters uh, and people loved them, reviews, they were great, but then it, it did take four or five years for people to, to notice, but then maybe it took four or five years for us to find our, our artistic voice because yeah. We then, those four or five shows, they were all written by Ollie and directed by both of us, but I think it was only when we had a real meaningful creative collaboration with Tom Gisby on the music side of things, Sam Wire on the design side of things, and, and uh, that we kind of found a bit of a style that people probably know us with now, which was probably the next slide, which was uh, The Terrible Infants, uh, which premiered in 2007. These are images from when we bought it back in 2018 at Wilson's Musical. Uh, this show has been toured to Australia, to most of Europe, to uh, Scandinavia, um, and Singapore, Singapore. Malaysia. Yeah, it, 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 uh, and this was the show that originally cost us, as Ollie said, £7,000. Uh, obviously, this, these pictures and these images are from we did at Wilson's when. Um, it was considerably higher budget than that. <laughs> um, but 
this was the but first time created. Yes, well, it was the same. It, yeah. yeah, more. I mean, the, the cart did go through quite a few rebounds, but um, this was uh, the first show that we did as as creators and as writers that we did direct address to the audience. We really focused on the storytelling uh, well, of exactly. it. Well, uh, yes, different I mean, type. different type, yeah. Uh, this was the first time that we worked with actor musos and, and live music, and, and first time we worked with puppets uh, as well. Puppets. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it, it, was a, it was a big turning point um, for us, and the first time that Sam and Tom meaningfully did, you know, did all the design, did all the music, and, and uh, it was a, a huge success, thankfully. And, but at the time, it was a massive gamble for us, because we were going from a 50 seater the year before into Pleasance 2, which is, I think, a 350 seater. Uh, it? Maybe it's 250, but, but it, it was still quite a big leap and, and, it, and a, a highly respected space at the Pleasance. Uh, so it was a real leap, but. Um, and then the year after, like the leap from Pleasance 2 to the Cow. Yes, and then we did it in the Underbelly Cow, which is 400 seats. But this show kind of resonated with a lot of people, critically and commercially, and um, we, as I was saying earlier, a lot of people, a lot of venues wanted to book it, and subsequently we did that. Sorry for question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, if that's okay. I'm interested to know, a show can do absolutely very, very well, really good audience reviews and press reviews and all of that, and there are, I'm sure everyone, uh, hope, we're hoping, resonates that there are shows that you say, oh, that's really, really good, but you probably won't go back and see it a second time. You think it's really good, but you probably won't go back. There are shows that you will go, even some now in the West End, you'll go back over and over and over again. How can you tell from the first success that that is a show that you should keep going and keep investing in, kind of building on every year, or actually, that's just a very good show, nothing wrong with it, sure. but you shouldn't care around doing that. <laughs> Does that make sense? sense? Have you got an answer? I've got an answer to this. Well, obviously we're biased, and every director and creator um, will, you know, loves their own show. Oh, I think show. I've got so much. What yeah. well, <laughs> has the What are the kind of... This show, I always say about this show, that I think there's something for everyone in this show, Terrible Infants. I think if you hated the show, you cannot be, I think, you cannot be impressed, cannot not be impressed by the puppetry. The, the puppets that Sam has designed in this is amazing. Or if you hate puppets and don't want to see puppets, you can't help but be impressed by the music. Or, you know, the writing. Uh, and, and I think we tend to throw a lot of our sh lot, lot at our shows. There's a lot going on. And that's not, again, it, it does all come from story, but I think most of our shows, I think there's a lot happening, and I think they can, that, that can have repeat. But that's not views. answering the question. Well, as in, <laughs> as in why a show is... What, how do you tell if a show is... What What's I would say is... You don't need people. You don't need people to come back to your show more than once because there's enough people to to make a very very successful show if they only see it once. I think I think ultimately it's got to, it's got to come from you really. Like I I think I think it's I don't think many shows just like are organically successful. I think ultimately. You make a show and it's done well in Edinburgh. The reason that more people will see it is if you make that happen. So unless you're very lucky and someone comes in and goes, hey, this is great, I'm gonna take this show and put it on here, which we've been waiting for someone to do for 20 years and never happened. Um, ultimately, the life of the show comes down to you continuing that life and you will get people like like we said people will you do a show in Edinburgh and you get a lot of theatres calling you to say are you going to do this show again then then you know there's an appetite for mm. it but at the same time you can still if you it, if you love if you love and believe in the show and you want to and you want it to keep going then keep it going and people will come you know sorry I, I guess no that's really really useful I, I don't know whether you agree with that, but I think there are some shows for an artist that is just lives as that project, and mm -hmm. but that is a springboard for them to do their second project, which yeah, is a really yeah, different yeah. show. And there are shows that are meant to live on and on and on. And 
How can you tell at that early stages whether that's just a stepping stone that went really well, but let's now make it different. So let's build on some of the skills we learned from that first project and do a second project, or actually you should build a first project and to become a bigger one. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tell. Because I don't think I don't think you're we didn't know I don't think beginning of the I don't think anyone's going into a show thinking it's a stepping stone. I mean, maybe some people do, but I think you're assuming that the show that you're going into is going to be that show. What I would say is, like, I don't, I think, like, you, you also think about shows as being organic themselves, you know, like, you do the first version of the show, mm. you know, we met, this show has been changed and rewritten and remade so many times, so, you know, you might do something the first time and being like, this was great, but it could be better. So let's do it again and change it. And so, you know, like with Terror Infants, it, 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 we added different stories and we, you know, so, you know, a show can be a different show. The same show can be a different show if, if, you, if there's something in it. I mean, I think in a way, in a way the answer to that question is sort of whether the people that make it want to keep making it ultimately i think if you want to keep doing it then there's something there you know because i guess also if people want to see it if you know if, if but people will see you, it if you if you put it like people won't but it take it from you you have to you have to you give have it to push, them and then, and then convince them to come and see it regardless but we, even we're, when we do this we still in a, have to like convince people to buy you do, tickets. You do, absolutely, and we did in 2018. But obviously, we're, we're in a very different time now after the pandemic, where venues are, you know, around the country are are taking less risks, mm. and and that's really sad. But then you understand that because that they, they need money, they need to survive, they need surefire bets that they can bring money in. So it's a harder environment out there. Maybe they'll, you know, they can hire a a Jimmy car for one night to pack it out, but you know, it's only one person have to pay in loads, whatever, but they sell, but then they can, you know, the next night take a chance somewhere else. But but they venues are taking less chances because of the pandemic. It's also yeah, it's also understanding what, what you're making the show for. Like if you're if if you're if you're looking at it in like, is this a commercial hit that can run in the West End for twenty years? Then then you can probably answer your question much easier if it's a you know if it's a smaller scale piece of work that is going to have a more niche audience anyway then it does become a lot more about the artists i think and the, and the people making it i think mm, yeah um th i think the next slide is a is another uh, sh show uh that we started in edinburgh uh called the border villains um uh, and this just to just to emphasize i guess from an artistic point of view our kind of where we approach shows of of uh, we were on tour with the other show terrible infants and then i think ollie and tom were like hey we should do a musical next mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of our artistic uh i guess pro uh, process of thinking what do we want to do what would we like to see what would we really love to present and you know we'd never done a musical before and we did this show called the border villains and you know in our style of course uh, but I think another thing about our artistic uh, policy is usually Ollie and I see something and we're either frustrated with that something and think, oh, wouldn't it be cool if that something did this, this and this? Um, and that's usually how we approach. This was born out of probably 10 years ago in Edinburgh. There was loads of burlesque and loads of circus and it was really cool and it was a really happening scene but we were watching a lot of it thinking well, this is great but wouldn't it be better if there was a storyline to, to to this burlesque or, or circus and, and that's how this show came about with that we're usually inspired by other filmmakers and uh, theatre makers and filmmakers and books um, but ultimately you've got to, you've got to make what you love because yeah. it's going to be hard work you might not get anyone to come see it you might lose all your money, you might not get any sleep, you might fall out with people over it, and like, you've got the, you know, that's hard, it's really, it's much harder if 
You hate the thing that you're doing as well. <laughs> if, no. if, you, if you love a new art, at least if you're making something that you really believe in, that can kind of carry you through it. Yeah, it can. Um, but I mean, every yeah. producer or company also has a, you know, a failure with a success as well. And no one knows what's going to work, otherwise everyone would do it. You know, even Andrew Lloyd Webber or whoever you want to look at, everyone's had failures. Everyone knew this show is a surefire hit whether it's a film or book or, or whatever, that, there's no such thing as that, as knowing right from the off, but having that love, obviously, as I said, helps. Um, the next, thank you. Um, yeah, so we just briefly talk about this, where uh, we did this show, Alice's Adventures of Ground. Again, uh, from that emphasis of what I said before, we were seeing quite a few immersive shows in 2013, uh, 2014 and becoming a bit frustrated <laughs> that there's no storyline to it and we thought well wouldn't it be great if there was an immersive show but with a storyline that the audience went through a progression a beginning a middle and an end and so we took a massive risk massive massive risk and and we entered into the commercial world really I mean we were kind of dipping our toes in it with our other shows and doing it without realizing it but the commercial world is how the West End is run is you know raising money from investors and and, it, and we didn't know how to do that we didn't know what to do that the budget in 2015 for this was monumentally bigger than anything we've ever done before and huge and if the show hadn't have done very well we wouldn't be sitting here thankfully it did but it all came from that artistic drive of doing something different but being inspired by something else we took over the vaults um the first company to do that and turn the whole vaults into wonderland but really, really thought about intimacy, really thought about audience journey, narrative audience journey. We felt all these immersive shows at the time, there were too many people in them and we wanted this narrative arc and a narrative journey through it. Um, and it was a real change for us uh, in, in many ways. I think quite a lot of people still think we're a, an immersive theatre company and I, I don't mind that, but we existed 15 years prior to doing an immersive show. But we both directed this show as we direct other shows and even though they're very, very different, we still approach them in the same way. We want to tell a story. And I don't think that how we approach them artistically is a million miles away. We couldn't do this show on our own. We co-produced it with someone who was a more traditional West End producer. It took about a year for us to find that person, but we knew we wanted someone who would come from, say, that side, the right, we came from the left, and we met in the middle. I mean, she learned a lot from us, and we learned a lot from her about the commercial world, and I think uh, doing it down here as well really brought, brought something to, to the show. We bought it back in 2017, and we thankfully got it licensed to China for two years uh, in Shanghai and um, it, it was a bit of a game changer for us as a company. Uh, but if we go on to the next slide, we weren't stopping here with immersive theatre, so maybe you want to talk about the next one? Or... Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, and, and again, that kind of led to a lot of uh, different things. So we haven't really done a kind of Alice-sized follow-up yet. <laughs> We will, that will be coming soon. But we have done kind of a lot of other... I think what we then, you know, again, we kind of got led by what we found interesting. So we did a show, <clears throat> we did an immersive dining experience again, which was here, which was uh, with the Roald Dahl estate based on the Twits because we love Roald Dahl. We did a, an immersive thing with Pussy Riot um, which we collaborated with them on, which was kind of, again, mental, but like, if Pussy Riot asked you to make a show with them, you say yes. Um, this was at uh, Kensington Palace, um, which again was just like a kind of cool idea of going, how do, we, how do we make one of our shows in Kensington Palace and how do we kind of do what we do um, there? So, we, you know, we, it's been... You know, when you have a show like Alice, which is a kind of a commercial hit, then you, then people start approaching you for stuff. And I suppose, you know, as we've said, our, our, our attitude, our artistic policy has always been what would be cool, what would be fun. Um, and so that's kind of led us, but that leads us into this as well. Other people, as, as well as for the theatre shows approach us, is when we also get approached sometimes by brands and um, companies. 
Yeah, and, and I think Alice was a bit of a gateway for that. I think, uh, and we all know what immersive theatre has been over the last seven years, and, and a lot of brands are, are trying to buy into that. And, um, you know, we, we're doing an event in Luxembourg in three weeks' time, uh, which is kind of branded as, as their branding it, as the, the biggest immersive experience in the world. But I don't know whether... The ESH is the European... City of Culture. City of Culture. Opening. Uh, but these these events that we do for brands or, or, or activations, they're, they're usually really fulfilling ways of working with new partners, new collaborators, new artists, um, and uh, they, they're they pretty full on, and they're usually only one day, they last, but the budgets are, are usually quite big uh, as well, and that gets us playing in the toolbox, which is great. And also, you know, to be, honest with you guys as well it has been a financial income for the company as well which has been which has been very useful uh, you know we're, we're not an MPO uh, how we are funded there's always been grants for the arts project by project basis you beg borrowing stealing if show has done well we use that money and take it and put it into the next production so we kind of put all of our money more or less on Alice and, and luckily it did well Alice made a bit of money but it also gave us some notoriety for brands to come in and say, love Dallas, can you come and do this for us? Say Heineken or Toyota. And, and it's been a good money earner as well. Uh, but at the same time, there's been huge amounts of creativity and these brands are usually amazing to work with by, by saying, what do you guys want to do? Let's do something really different and creative. And that's really cool as, as theatre makers. Um, so we'll move on now to uh, opportunities. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Sure. Well, I guess, um, there's no, um, what, what kind of brand activation, like what, what are some examples of the kinds of things that you've done So it could be anything from like Ikea launching a new speaker and so they want to do a thing in North London for like, what, a month? It's three, yeah, it's about three, three weeks. Yeah. where people can book free tickets and they come in and they basically see this experience and within that experience, the speakers are showcased, or Stella Artois want to do a similar thing, that was like six weeks? Or, no, no, it was only no, about three weeks Three ago. weeks, but again, people could book tickets, and, they're, and they're, those sort of things are basically shows, or they can be um, experiences for, we did one for Canon, which was, they were releasing a new camera, and they brought a load of influencers, influencers and photographers to use the camera, and they basically said, we need stuff for them to photograph, so we created this, oh big world and that and they came in and they tried out the camera but what we always do with all of these is is put a story to it when, mm. when these brands or, or agents well, we use it as an excuse to just do loads of fun stuff yeah but i say to them i, I always say to them i say we're not an events company we're a theater mm. company you are hiring a theater company probably off we're, we're going to put a narrative in this whether it's subtle or whether it's overt or when some people pick up whatever this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a beginning, middle, and end, just like we did with uh, our, our immersive shows. People wanting to treat their customers, people wanting to treat their clients, yep. people wanting to showcase a new project product. It can be anything, really. We, we did one in Detroit, which was for a new computer game called um, Detroit. Um, <laughs> yep. And we went to Detroit and we made a, like, a live action version of the version game. Of the game. <laughs> What it comes down to is that, it, which is really exciting, uh, and I hope this happens after the pandemic, after, but brands are looking at different ways to sell their products to consumers. Mm -hmm. You know, traditional advertising, I mean, there are people know a lot more about this than me, but that, that uh, is, is dead in, in a way, but, and that opened my eyes with the Toyota job that we did, where the budget was ridiculous, and Obviously, someone in Toyota, you know, the clever, intelligent people, the market departments, and all these people sat down and thought, "We've got this money. We're launching a new car. Do we do it as a TV campaign and an out of house, you know, adverts all the way around, or do we do something different?" And they went, "Let's do something different. Let's create an event for a hundred influencers and bill it as the world's. It's always the world's first, isn't it? <laughs> the world's first immersive car experience." And we took a uh, hundred people in all these cars at different points around printworks in, in London and we've built these four different But so thinking of that, thinking behind that is getting, we did another one for Heineken where we took a load of people to the Champions League final and they 
where the bus and the bus broke down and then they had to get hij they hijacked a kind of circus bus and then they went in a helicopter and <laughs> wow. but the thinking behind it is, and it's mental like you go how why are you spending so much money on this thing but the thinking behind it is you do this event for a hundred people and those hundred people all have a hundred thousand followers online and they're tweeting you know like you, you guys will all know you have that experience with people that you follow on Instagram or Twitter or whatever it is. You engage with their content in a much more personal le level than if you if an advert comes on while you're watching, you know, iPlayer, mm. you'll see that. If it's someone that you're engaged with mm. and they are posting and talking about this, there's a much more connected. So, and, and I think that is what has been a big thing with brands. It's like we live in an experience economy. We live on like social media and so going it's it's brands basically going how do we tap into that we're all obsessed with our phones and and information on that so it so it's like creating experiences that can then be shared personally so that information gets disseminated through kind of human hmm. i think yeah um yes so to come a bit full circle why we talked about edinburgh we uh 10 years ago so this the, the anniversary was was this year we set up the, the letter ward where basically we wanted to, to take a company that was maybe similar to us uh, up to Edinburgh uh, and the, the award is basically for a theatre company. Uh, each year they get a guaranteed slot at the Pleasance. Uh, we give them a bit of money, £1,300, we pay for their deposit. Uh, they get mentorship from us as well to produce uh, a show up in <coughs> Edinburgh. Uh, every year we have about 100 companies that um, apply and then we whittle it down to 10, which is very hard, and then those 10 present 10 minutes of their show uh, in, a, in an evening, which happened two weeks ago, uh, the last one, and then on the evening we uh, award one of those companies with the award. Uh, it's been 10 years, like I said, 10 year anniversary was this year, but it's, it's something that we feel quite passionate about, uh, about opportunities and and uh, helping others that, that don't have those opportunities as well. Um, not just the letter ward, if we go to the next slide, Ollie can talk about the, uh, this, the bursary uh, scheme. Yeah, and again, this is just about, you know, trying to kind of, I think, as we talked about at the start, is that we've seen opportunities for people kind of um, diminish over the years, and I suppose <coughs> we're trying to do our, a, a small bit to try and help um, you know, throw some balance in the other direction. So the bursary is basically we just we find people that um, are maybe struggling to pay for their uh, arts training, um, drama school, and we basically we pay a, a bursary of three thousand five hundred um, a year. No, is that right? About that. Uh, and, and towards their towards their costs, um, and we do that every year. We have a different. Um, person who we award that to every year and then we see them through drama school but then we also kind of support and mentor them outside of that as well. Um, another scheme that we have is the Step Ladder Award which uh, is for a company that have already produced a few shows so this is kind of the evolution from the Letter Award it's usually for shows that have uh, been up in Edinburgh uh, maybe they've been taking a show once or twice to the festival, uh, but they're looking for that next step of how do they break out of the festival? How do they get out of uh, you know the festival that they're in? And what, how can I make it from here, just doing a show once a year, to making this my job into touring? Uh, and that's what this award is for. We help a company, it, we, I think this is the fifth year coming up, uh, tour, essentially, and in collaboration with a company called Home, uh, sorry, House, uh, who are a tour agency type booking uh, company and they're great and with them we help the company book a tour. We have connections obviously with a lot of venues around uh, the UK uh, and we help in a producing level and we get them to do you know a three four month tour. Uh, a show usually you know starts in Edinburgh and then goes on from that. Um, next steps from this we, we wanted to you know our these are well, the first two are quite Edinburgh focused, but Ollie and I are starting to talk about making this, you know, not just Edinburgh focused, but giving these opportunities to companies outside of the Edinburgh Festival. Mm -hmm. um, talking to a venue in, in Manchester about doing a little festival up there, about 
uh, you know, expanding, uh, you know, whether it's something like the step uh, ladder award or the net award where a company does uh, a run at the home uh, venue, which is in Manchester, uh, and then, then they can tour afterwards. So that will be hopefully, you know, coming up this year um, with that. Uh, next slide, I think we are there, yeah. And, uh, I know we started a bit late, but it's half past, but we've... Um, no, that's all right, no, it's good. We're, we're bang on, on 4.30, which is it's almost like it was all done deliberately. <laughs> but we started a bit late, so we're uh, happy to yeah, answer some questions.